Everybody and welcome back to Coombe Valley Campus. Today we're going to be fitting power steering to Chippy, the split screen bus belonging to Joe Sugg. But that's not just going to be the whole video. In between the kit being made and actually fitting the kit to Chippy, we're going to be fitting sound deadening to the van. We're going to be lifting him right up in the air, doing some under sealing with some wax oil. We're going to be doing the gear linkage and we have Andy Gregory from Heritage coming down to work on the gearbox. So without further ado, let's pack up the car and head straight down to light steer and take him the steering column. This is what we've brought you today. We have got, um, basically it's the whole bit that came out of the of the wagon. I haven't touched it. I don't know what fluids it's got in it. Um, okay. I want to have your assessment really as to what it is and how we can improve it. And then, you know, if we can tear it down, that'd be awesome. Sure. Super. Let's go on with it. Yeah, as you can see, it looks like someone's already rebuilt it, Neil, because it's been painted. Yeah. That's, and that's what it means, right? Yeah, of course it is, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what would be your normal process so, when so you get I, one of these? If I just paint this, then it's rebuilt. It's rebuilt, right? right? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, sort of run us through your process of to how you'd assess one and where you'd go from there. Yeah, basically just start with giving it a strip down to take uh -huh. this malarkey off that you've put on that you don't need. It should be a little collar under there, but that'll probably come out later. Mm -hmm. Don't lose your Woodruff key. Nope, we did drop that once already, but I don't think we did that on camera. <laughs> okay. So, so already, is there any points you can see that might need sorting, or is there any plane um, there? That... Not yet, really. Um, I'm not going to get too into guesswork. Uh huh. So you may as well just open it up. Yep. See exactly what's going on. They often feel pretty rough if they've been sitting for a while, so they get dry and so on. Mm -hmm. She was on there. <laughs> that was on there. Cool. Now is that keyed? No, I was going to do this for your little kind of when it gets refitted. Yep. You've got a scribe line on there and a scribe line on there. Yep. I'll see they match up. Super. I think what we do maybe is turn it around and that way. Just do it. Okay, we've got a lock tab on, but they've not been knocked over, so we'll just push it. Knock them over and then yep. lock them. So there's a chance that kind of may have been broken into before. Yeah, somebody's been in there yep. at some point. And then painted yeah, it. There we go. And then painted it. So if I remember rightly, the, the only way that shaft is going to come all the way out is via that plate at the bottom. Yeah, oh. once, you've, um, once you've taken the plate mm -hmm. and then drawn the main output shaft out. Now, one of the things I remember from your customers who have had these kits fitted in the past is their their horn didn't used to work, and didn't then you work. fitted one of the kits, and the horn yeah. did work afterwards. Now, obviously, <laughs> we see on this one that 
the it's the earth wire, isn't it? This one that goes all it the is. way through. Yep. Um, so if it, anything does happen to it, it's obviously not going to make anything else live. But it obviously needs to go from the horn push all the way through. And back in the day, that was the only way they could do it. Um, so we're not actually going to replicate that, or we are? No, we're not, because obviously your kit sits halfway up. Yeah. Um, but it's the fact that it's earthed from that horn push, then to the body of the motor, and then the motor's earthed to the. Or the I can't quite remember now. <laughs> it's been a while, Neil. Yeah. It has. <laughs> so the so the motor unit is earthed itself. Yeah. So so the shaft will pick up its earth through the bearing mm -hmm. of the motor. So the idea is that we have a slip ring on the top shaft. That then conducts the power from the horn up to your button. Mm -hmm. As soon as you touch that on an earth, completes the circuit, sounds the horn. Simple as that. Simple as that. So it's a it's not the cheapest way to fix your horn, but it's a pretty good way to no. fix your horn. <laughs> it, it's a nice uh, benefit if you like. So we have fluid or not? Doesn't look uh, like much is coming it, out of there. It looks a bit uh, looks a bit dry. Right. So when this comes off we'll see what sort of lube, if any, is in there. Nice. Oh. Oh. Perfect. So first impressions, it's obviously got some so, sort of fluid yeah, in it. It's, it's nice to see some kind of uh, lubrication. Yeah. Now often these are say often, fairly often they're, they're actually filled with grease for yep. some strange reason. Um, not the right lube at all. When the when the pin goes across the screw, it'll push any fluid that's on there off. Yeah. And then if it's grease, it's going to disappear. And it's push it off and back. then never come so back it's again. It's not going to refresh. Yeah. The oil will obviously just straight away fill the gap in and off. And we've got a perfect example right here. Indeed. It's the 8090. Yeah. Brilliant. Cool. And that is just generally yeah, a gear oil. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's basically an EP oil. EP means extreme pressure. So it, it will it won't break down. You get two points like two gears. Right. Two teeth on a gear. Imagine there's a lot of pressure on that. Uh -huh. So uh, a lucky like average oil would just break down. And you filled up 1500 of these or there and there about or something like that. Enough. <laughs> goes, a little bit of rust, making that a little bit reluctant to, yep. uh, to come out. Well that arm um, was pretty reluctant as well, wasn't it? We'll give that a clean, mm -hmm. we can inspect that. First impression though, no, the bushes feel quite nice. Yeah. Now we'll put uh, a little bit of rust on the uh, on the shaft, so we'll clean that up. Perfect. Okay. Cool. So we can give that a turn without anything on it. And actually, that feels pretty good as well. Good. Has to be said. Is that the ring? There's your four inch and collar. Yep. Don't lose. Don't lose that. So is the job we're doing right now obviously easier to do on a bench? Can it be performed on the vehicle to a point or is it just the re-oiling you can do? Actually you can, you can strip you can strip it um, yep. on the car. But you've obviously got to have the front end up enough to withdraw to the whole column out, out. Yeah, and if you're pulling it up so. that high you might as well pull the whole column out anyway and do it on the bench. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I mean there's five bolts holding that to the chassis mm -hmm. and then the... Uh, I've got to say when everything unbolted pretty easily um, the whole thing had been wax oil but I think when we took the front beam off that was obviously the first time that was ever taken off um, but yeah as, as far as a, a 67 right hand drive split goes I think it's done pretty well so yeah. Too good bad. not too bad and on this part if i remember rightly again you do see wear on the inner parts of the gear when they're knackered is that right where, where else should we be looking for signs of wear normally you'll you'll see it in the center because uh -huh. that's where your steering wheel is mostly so so your shaft is literally just doing that most of the time just to, mm -hmm. to track in the road 
So yeah, the most way will be in that centre section, but uh, we'll give it a clean up. And then but the fact it's that it's not been filled with grease and it wasn't dry and it had a form of lube yeah. in it is a good start. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. Yeah, I know it seems strange to put it in the other way around. Yeah, yeah. But you're actually still, you, you're checking the bush in a slightly different um, orientation than it's normally in, and it gives you a better indication of how much play there is. Yeah. So you can see there's that, just a tiny bit there. That's probably only about a thou or something like that. And that's in terms of tolerance, you're, you're looking yeah. for a, a, enough. You need a gap. Yeah. You need an oil gap. Yeah. Otherwise the bush will just go dry and then it'll end up wearing. So that is in really good shape. Cool. There's a tiny bit of play in there. But no. Because obviously there. if you've got a little movement there or a movement in there that's slightly out of tolerance, obviously when it comes to the wheel, the movement can be quite big. So you're yeah. trying to minimise those tolerances exactly. as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. But that's acceptable. Yeah, that's fine. Excellent. Yeah, well within tolerances. Um, have a quick examine of the pin. There was a couple of tiny little marks in there if you wanted to be really fussy about it. But it's in pretty good shape, to be honest. Are with those you. parts even available? If they you, are, yeah. You can are. buy new pins. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can buy the bearings, but you can certainly buy new pins. So, shaft's in good nick, the yeah. bushings are in good nick. The seal came out, which is a good start. Eventually. Um, and we've started cleaning everything up. What's the next stage for us? Uh, so let's just have a look at the bones on the main shaft then. Mm -hmm. So these need to basically run nice and free. Grab hold of it, pull it, put some tension on it, see if it feels rough. If it doesn't, then it's fine. There's no need at this point to disassemble because they're if you loose can't, roller bearings. If you no, can't feel any notchiness bearings. on there, uh -huh. then chances are you're going to dismantle it and it's going to be fine. That is the first part of this done. We've done the strip down and the assessment and we've started the clean up as well. It's really, really helpful having obviously an expert that deals with this sort of, deals with this sort of thing every day. Um, and can just tell by feel and experience and the knowledge that everything is within tolerance. We've uh, checked the bearings, sorry, the bushings. Um, we've had a look at the bearings on the bottom of the main shaft itself, and we've just done a basic cleanup. We're gonna be rebuilding this to a point for you guys. So if you are watching this and you want to rebuild or at least recondition your steering box, then you can go ahead and bolt that all back together. What we'll do once it is rebuilt is we'll then hand it over to Neil and then he can do the power steering conversion on it. And uh, yeah, we'll get back a nice shiny unit and we can refit that back at the shop. But before we do that, let's put this in back together. What are we putting in that's new and what are we putting in that's original when it comes to rebuilding then? Pretty much everything that came out will yep. be refitted. I'm gonna fit a new oil seal and that's pretty much it. We might uh, change some of the shims uh -huh. for, the, uh, for the bearings, but we'll We'll put it together, see what the preload feels like, go from there, and then I'll explain about shimming as we go. And as far as steering box goes, you're definitely happy with what you've seen so far. Tolerances are good. It's just gonna be a case of bolting it back up together. Exactly, yeah, it's in pretty good shape, really. Yep. Um, it's nice to see a bit of oil come out of it, because that sort of straight away gives you a bit of confidence. But uh, And even no, from it pulling nice. it apart, you could tell that it had been worked in in the past. Yeah, somebody's been in there, but, um, Thankfully, they haven't done anything. No lasting damage. Really. No. Yeah. So yeah. seal in first. Yep. Then what's seal. next after that? What's our order of process? Seal in first. We'll put the main shaft in. Mm -hmm. uh, set the preload bearings on that, and then the uh, the output shaft. 
and then we'll also set up and we'll readjust that as well. And in a similar sort of sense to an engine rebuild, do we need to pre-oil bits as they go in? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Don't put anything in dry because yep. you won't get the right feel of it. It's a lot about feel, you know, it's this sort of how much preload on a bearing, how much backlash you've got in a gear, that sort of thing, you know, a lot of it's, you, you sort of feel when something's right, if you like. Yeah. It's very difficult to describe over Again, which is why we've got you here, you know, because <laughs> you'll know that by feel, but, yeah, but that's exactly. perfect. Yeah. Excellent, and now it'll be a case of buttoning it all up and then we can hand it over for the actual conversion. Cool. Super. So that basically sets up how far this shaft is pushed onto that screw. Yeah. That's all that does. It just puts a little bit of load onto that. Mm -hmm. You should only really feel it when you're in the straight ahead position. So. Oh, so the resistance of actually turning left and right, yeah. that's the resistance you should feel. Because right. that pin moves in an arc, uh -huh. the closest it will be to that shaft is when it's perpendicular to it. So as soon as that moves out of that, you'll actually get... Oh, I see. So the motion of it having that screw is actually trying to push it out because of the nature of the shape of the pin. And then the adjustment screw is just holding it into a point. It's just hot, stopping it gotcha, being gotcha, pushed gotcha, out. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So as it goes either side or straight ahead, yeah. it's loose. And when it's in the center, And all that needed was a damn good clean and degrease because yeah. obviously that's been painted over and snotted up for yeah that's not been touched for a while so that uh, that just a screw and nut was pretty seized up so. and so is there a gasket that goes on that or? there is a gasket yeah i won't put a gasket on it because we're going to strip this anyway to mm -hmm. put your power steering kit on but there is a gasket you can use a little bit of sealant like silicon sealant something like that yeah in some ways it's preferred because uh, gives you a more stable housing when they're metal to metal almost. So. And there's no real occasions where that might be warped or damaged and you'd have to flatten it out or is it? It's pretty unlikely. Uh -huh. You'd have to be a bit of an animal to yeah. do something like that. So Always back off your adjuster so when you bolt the housing on you're not going to risk breaking it mm -hmm. because it's been over adjusted at some point. So. Oh some nice new hardware too. Oh, yeah. Lovely lovely. Oh. It's all good stuff. Are you in the practice of pink or yellow dotting anything that you talk or tighten up? I know some garages if, can if, be. If you do like a like an engine assembly, yeah. then yeah, because chances are you're not going to build it all in one go. Yeah. You're going to sort of come back to it. So get it pretty much in the straight head position. Tighten your adjuster screw to you can just feel a little bit of resistance. Almost like so adjusting a valve with the... Yeah, almost. Yeah. I mean, you can see there that as I was tightening that, mm -hmm. the shaft is going out and then it'll just pop. So you can feel it just tighten up. Yeah. You see, you've just got probably 45 degrees there with an area of slightly more drag than, than the rest of it. And that's all you need just to take that little bit of play off. There you go. Thank you very much. One very nice steering box. Whilst Neil has the steering column for Chippy and is modifying it for the electric power system, we took the opportunity to do a load more work on Chippy. We lifted the vehicle right up in the air, covered it with basically a skirt, cleaned the underside from front to back, and then covered the entire chassis in a wax underseal. Now it was a completely filthy job and not very pleasant. However, we filmed everything. So I look forward to bringing you the entire episode in the future. So look forward to that. We also concentrated on the cab of the vehicle. We ripped out the seats, the carpet, and we undersealed the wheel tubs. 
and the cab floor and that'll just reduce the road noise when Joe drives Chippy in the future. Whilst in the cab we ripped out 50 years worth of wiring repairs and quote unquote improvements. I have a whole bucket full of old wiring now um, that was unnecessarily added to Chippy, the poor boy, and now everything works as it should. Andy Gregory from Heritage also popped down to help us work on Chippy's gearbox. Now, when we were asking Heritage, par Heritage Parts for the components for the build, one of those was gearbox gaiters or gearbox to drive shaft gaiters. And Andy wanted to pop down not only to see the progress of the vehicle, but to lend a helping hand too. Whilst the gearbox was out of the vehicle, we took the opportunity to restore the gear linkage from front to back. It was rusted, the bushes were worn out, as well as the rubber grommets. Now also, we film that from start to finish and we look forward to bringing you that in a future episode. If you remember from the first video, when the vehicle was delivered to us, there was about a dozen keys for all of the doors. There was a separate one for the ignition, the front side door, the passenger door, and the cargo doors. So we took the opportunity to grab a brand new kit from Heritage Parts, and we took the opportunity again to replace all the locks. So everything now opens from one key. So today is a big day. We have a package arriving, which is the actual power steering kit. So without further ado, let's head straight onto it and fit the power steering to Chippy, Joe Suggs, split screen camper van. Before we go any further, I just wanna say thank you very much for watching this video. We're doing a whole series on Chippy. So if you don't wanna miss any episodes, make sure to give this video a like and click subscribe. Thank you very much. Now back to the show. When we left you, we were over at the workshop at Light Steer with Neil and we had dismantled the steering box from Chippy. We'd assessed all of the parts and then made sure that everything was A-OK -okay before we bolted it back together. We left the steering box and the whole column with Neil and he has brought it back today in this lovely packaging as a complete electric power assisted steering system. Um, I can't wait to unbox it with you and uh, we can show you the kit in its entirety and the newest improvements that have been made to the design. When you pull out the power steering kit from the box, the first thing that will greet you is the wiring loom. And the one thing I want to point out on the wiring loom is this GPS unit. Now, power steering will, or is designed to be operational at lower speeds. Older designs of this kit use the feed from the speedo cable, so a very analog system. The GPS unit allows the power steering to come on and turn off gradually the higher the speed gets. So three, three levels of power steering assistance, should we say, from naught to 25 miles an hour, you'll have full assistance on the steering, make it really, really nice and easy. Between 25 and 45 will be a medium level, and from 45 miles per hour upwards, there'll be little to no assistance in the steering, because as you're up to full speed, you really don't need the assistance for steering correction. So steering loom, um, really nice manufactured kit, it's one of the bits and pieces that I learned from Neil when I was working at Light Steer that wiring is, or the way a wiring loom is made and finished is extremely important. And this loom, for example, is absolutely beautiful. We've got some of the fixtures and fittings that help you fit the wiring kit, sorry, help you fit the steering kit. And if I remove that tissue, you can see The system in its entirety. Now it's in a few parts as you can see. We have the steering box which you'll recognize from the previous part of the video. Um, that's the original steering box to Chippy. That's the parts that we took apart, assessed and then bolted back together. Uh, the whole kit has been modified so it's a lot shorter. Um, you'll recognize that the top's missing. So the actual column gets chopped the center part of the column gets modified so we can slip on this collar, this splined bracket, which will connect the top and the bottom. The second part, or the upper part of the steering column, or the steering kit, should I say, is the real business end of the whole kit. You've got the NSK steering motor, 
noisy on there, isn't it? Uh, the NSK motor, which powers the assistance of the column itself. And one of the other new designs on the splitty system is this clamping collar here. Now, the steering box itself will get mounted underneath the van and the shorter section of steering column will protrude through the floor. And then you slide on the top part of the column. The spline section here will match up with the spline section of the column in this section. And then it very simply just clamps around the existing tube. Very efficient, very neat, and uh, just a design, uh, it, the, the design has evolved, basically. There's been feedback from the customers, there's been feedback from people in the trade. They loved this clamping system on another version of the steering kit that Light Steer do, and so the design has now been implemented onto the split system. So the other features you will notice are the wiring. So we've got the plugs for the loom that will connect into the existing loom. Uh, sorry, the main wiring loom, and we'll go through that later. And the other part, the eagle-eyed of you will notice that there's no horn wire coming out the bottom of the steering column or any facility for the horn wire to go through the system. So this system here has been cleverly implemented. There is a contact slip ring in here, which will basically provide you with your horn contact when you press the button. This plug here then connects onto the loom and then the lap, that will then feed the horn button. Uh, sorry, the horn itself under the chassis. Last item to point out is the ECU. This is the brains of the system and that will read the signal from the GPS unit. So when you are traveling from zero to 25, 25 to 45 and 45 and onwards, um, the ECU will tell the motor how much power it needs to provide to the system to give you the different levels of steering assistance. The GPS unit itself, um, that will provide the coil signal now. Previously it didn't do that. You would, re you would rely on the signal from the coil in an older air cooled engine. Splitties and other buses now are, they're having a lot of engine upgrades or engine swaps such as electric motors or diesels or a Subaru conversion and not all of those engines will provide you with a coil live. So having a GPS unit is kind of twofold. Not only will it give you a more accurate reading of your speed, but it will provide that coil signal as well. So I think that's enough about talking about the actual kit itself. I'm eager to get it in. Um, let's get rid of the box, lift the fan up and start bolting it in place. Now we're on to the exciting part actually bolting on all of this reconditioned and new equipment back onto the bus. This is the original steering box, as we've explained, and then we've got all the new parts from Light Steer. We have cleaned up the area where the steering box mounts, and we've just run a tap through the existing threaded hole. So there's gonna be no issues when we come to bolt back up, and the bolts themselves have actually all cleaned up on a wire wheel as well. So there should be no issues at all. Before we go ahead and mount this to the actual chassis itself, what you wanna make sure is this arm is oriented in the, in the right direction. And that is basically dead ahead. If you imagine your steering wheel is in the center, so your vehicle is driving true and straight down the road, your arm, the steering arm, is at this point directly up. Now you will know that by feeling when you are twisting the uh, coupling on this shaft here. And what I'm gonna do is twist it one way till it stops and you can hear that click where it stopped. Then if I turn back the other way, you'll start to feel a little bit of resistance as it reaches the topmost point. I'll go past that resistance, back to the stop the other side, go back to the center, and what you want is halfway through that tight feeling is the sweet spot and you'll know it when you feel it. And what we've done to make sure that once fitted, we can double check that this arm's in the right position. We've actually pre-marked it with a Tipex mark just underneath. So when it's all bolted up and ready to go, we'll just have a quick look underneath again, check that those two marks line up and we know we're ready to complete the installation. The last things to note then before we actually 
put the box up into the chassis is first of all you've got to remove this coupling here because it won't fit through the hole in the floor and secondly now is the best opportunity to fill the steering box with oil now it's 80 90 gearbox oil and we're just going to unscrew the little grub screw there fill it with oil and then place the steering box in the chassis for the final time Put the steering box in a vise just to make it easier for you to see. However, you can do this kind of freehand if you wanted to. Um, just point to note, make sure that the box is level when you're filling it. We're gonna fill it to the top, but we're making sure the mounting platform there is straight and level, not that the actual steering column itself is bolt upright. That is the right orientation. So I've got what seems to be the world's smallest funnel. If it's lovely. We're going to put some of the gear oil in and it'll fill it to the top. Steering box filled with fluid, couple are removed off the top, holes are all clean, bolts are all clean. And there we go. Whoops, I do apologise. I had to pick the worst hole first, didn't I? That's the one we had a problem with, eh? So I'm going to put it in that one. At least it won't fall down then. There we go. There's one. Thank you. Now we've got the lower part of the steering box installed. You can just see the column coming through the floor there. We're gonna start with wiring the unit in. We are kind of lucky at this stage because not only is it gonna be easier for us, but it's gonna be better for you. The parcel shelf isn't in it. Um, so we can show you a nice route without the parcel shelf being in the way. You don't have to remove the parcel shelf to install yours, but, um, for the purpose of the video, it's absolutely ideal. So what I'm gonna do is take all the fixings and cable ties off here, and we'll start with feeding the cable up and over this front. I'm gonna say slam panel, this structural part of the dash here. Um, the cable will follow the route of the factory wiring over that panel, down through the floor, and right at the front of the vehicle, um, where the existing loom comes out, you will find one of a multitude of holes that you'll be able to pass this wiring through. Let's make a start. Now the loom is all unpacked and here in all its glory, I can just go over a cut of bits with you. So as discussed, that is the GPS unit. We have the main ignition feed that comes from the fuse panel and that is on a separate fuse also. This is the connector which fits into the column where the horn is and we discussed that earlier. The two substantial multi-pin plugs, they go into the ECU. As we feed further down the loom, that is the connector that goes on the other side, or the horn actually, under the floor at the chassis. And then all the way down the other end, oops, you have a large fuse because this is the main power feed from the battery itself. And this is the part that we're gonna thread up, over, down, and through uh, the dash and the chassis. But before you do anything, don't forget, we're gonna remove this fuse holder to actually start threading, because that's a bit clunky, gets in the way, um, and that'll be fitted at the other end once all the loom's been threaded through. Wiring loom is fed through, and for the next stage we need the parcel shelf in so that's been reinstalled as well luckily as you've seen in other shots or maybe on another video I've spent a lot of time on the wiring so happy that that is all set because it's going to be a lot more difficult to do that wiring with the shelf in place that aside there is now a procedure for putting the top half of the column in and there's some points to note as ever um, one of the first things we've done is reinstalled this collar and there are two points to note on that. There is a relief on one side 
that you have to line up with this collar, a relief being a little cut out in the top of the shaft. And that's when you feed this bolt through and tighten that up. There is, a same, there is the same aperture on the top where you feed a bolt through here once you've got all your splines lined up. When this column is in place, you're able to tighten those two bolts up through those two holes, if you notice these two down here. Before we go ahead and place the main shaft on that collar, you need to ensure that once the whole system is installed, this Woodruff key is pointing at 12 o'clock, if 12 o'clock is the front of the vehicle, sort of directly through the speedo. A couple of things to remember. Um, Woodruff key, collar in the right place. Before we go ahead and fit this over the collar, we have to remove the bottom part of this brace. So we're going to be removing these two Allen headed bolts. One. And two. When you come to reinstall that, just remember that there are two sides. One is painted, the other one isn't. It's got sort of the factory paint on it. Um, so ensure that the paint that matches this half is the one that's showing. And then we're ready. I'm taking this slowly because they're all points you're gonna need to remember. There are three right angled sides to this collar and one smooth side. This smooth side here is going to match up with this half of this shaft here. All right, so you're gonna feed the smooth side of this collar over here and then feed the whole lot onto it. Before you locate the shaft inside there to the splined collar, turn the entire assembly round until that Woodruff key is at 12 o'clock. Got it? I know there's a lot of information there, but what we're gonna do is go through it step by step, stage by stage. And when it comes to you doing it, we'll do it in one foul swoop, I promise. So, first thing, make sure this thinner part of the collar is going over this curved part, slot the whole shaft over this collar now. So that's over there. Before I then locate the splines into the collar, I'm gonna spin the whole system around. And that Woodruff key is now at 12 o'clock. That shaft is now all the way home, and ready to fit the bolts through, and we'll attach them through these two holes. Got it? You might find once the shaft is all aligned and your Woodruff key is in the right direction and the arm on the actual steering box itself is all aligned, you might find that your holes down here to tighten up the bolts on the collar aren't lined up. Now, if I try and turn the shaft now to line those holes up, it'll turn the whole column. So what I'm gonna do is mount the steering wheel so I've got a radius to grip onto and then I can turn those two cut parts, the actual shaft and the inner shaft, in two different directions, and then I'll be able to line the holes up, pop the bolts in, and that is that section done. There we go, those bolts are lined up now. We can put, pop them in, tighten them up, torque them up, and then we can go ahead and clamp the bottom of the outer shaft or the top half of the shaft to the bottom half of the shaft. Really nice and clean. Again, quite a detailed bit just to make sure it's all right, but believe me, if you put the effort in now and the time to get it all lined up, you'll have a really, really easy time further down the line. Before we go ahead and run the wiring, there's a couple more bits and pieces we've got to do. One is to secure, well, locate the actual motor, and then we're gonna secure it at the top half and put this clamp on. 
it's not a definitive position. However, we found uh, a good way of mounting or orientating that motor is to ensure that these two bolts here and this collar here at the bottom is square with the front of the seat or the seat base. So we're talking about there. That means when you're driving, all of this motor is out the way of your knees, um, just doesn't get in the way and sort of square to the front really. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna pop that collar in down. No, I'm not. Before I go ahead and tighten that collar up at the bottom, we're gonna now fit um, the top mount for the steering column and then we can go ahead and tighten everything else up and run the wiring. So join me, will you, whilst we finish that off. Next item on the agenda is fitting the control system, the ECU. A um, couple of places you can put it. You can either hide it behind the actual dash binnacle on the top of the shelf. Today, we're gonna to be mounting it underneath. And it's basically a case of finding a position you're happy with, scribing the holes, drilling through the shelf, and fix it using the supplied hardware. So let's get on with that. After mounting the ECU with the supplied fixings, we have spent a good amount of time just making sure all the cables are rooted nicely, they're plugged into the right places, and everything's neat and tidy. Um, we've mounted the steering wheel, we've provisionally mounted the indicator stalk as well, just to make it look a bit more complete, but to also get a good idea of how it's all gonna be for you guys when it's all put back together. I think now we've done this, oh, just as a point to note as well, we've, uh, We've stuck on the GPS unit just on the side of the box there. Um, this, the fitting of this kit applies to more than one vehicle. The loom's fairly universal, so it's gonna be a case of fitting the GPS um, in a position that it can still look up, so to speak, um, for obviously the satellite location and picking up the speeds, etc. What we're gonna do now is lift the van back up, head down underneath, route the wiring and the whole loom towards the back of the vehicle the correct way through the factory locations. Um, and once we've uh, located it back to where the battery sits, we'll power the whole system up and show you how it works. We can't show you it with the vehicle running because we're still minus running gear, um, but we can power the system up so we can show you and audibly show you when the uh, motor kicks in and turns off. And, uh, but no, we're, we're nearly there. It's a pretty smart looking unit so far and I look forward to showing you the rest of the install. We're in the final throws of fitting the entire kit now. And the last thing to do is to route the wiring loom and this terminal here, once it's routed through, we'll have a fuse attached to it and then a pigtail on the end of that, which will then locate onto the battery. Ideally, you want to be on the battery. The loom, as I said before, is fairly universal um, and really you want to pick your best route so you're not disturbing or getting in the way of any moving parts or any components. It's a little bit more difficult at this stage because we've not got all the mechanical and moving components here. So what we are going to do is route it following the line of existing cable tubes. So this one in particular here is for the accelerator, um, these two are for the heater cables, and as long as we uh, fasten it securely to those cables, then we won't have any problems. We would have loved to route the cable in the same route as the existing wiring loom. However, after trying to put a rod all the way through the chassis beam, it's, it's kind of impossible to get around that kink without having a pull through that's already in that section, so to speak. Anyway, we're gonna secure it nicely to existing parts, route it safely through the chassis. If you're going through any freshly drilled holes, make sure to uh, grommet them, um, grommet the actual metal hole before you run some cables through. So, 
Without further ado, I'll go and get the cable ties, go and get some side cutters, safely find our route, and I'll bring you back once we've got to the battery. And there we have it. We have the complete light steer kit installed. Last thing you saw was this route in the wiring through the chassis or onto fixing points on the chassis. We've attached the main live to the battery. And because, as we said before, we've not actually got a working ignition or the engine's not in or anything else, what we're gonna be doing is powering the ignition live uh, with just our test probe here. And it's just going to be a comparison really. Um, we've got the steering wheel moving left to right and there's a bit of tension up there and that's just tension through the system. Obviously I'm fighting against an unpowered motor there as well but the moment I apply the power you can hear the motor click on and you can almost see that's so much easier there and that is the power assisted steering in well just working um, and I take the power off you can hear the click and then the power assisted steering stops and there's way more effort to put into the steering when we give this a test drive once the bus is complete and we actually are driving it down the road you will really be able to see its effectiveness but for now that is how you install the power steering kit into a split window bus I can't wait to show Joe all this kit. It was something he wanted and it's gonna help him and Diane drive the bus and just be more comfortable driving it and maneuvering it into and out of tight spots. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks also to Neil from Light Steer for helping us out with the kit and for other bits and pieces on this bus and you are going to be seeing him on another video coming up soon. But for now, thanks again and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Coombe Valley Campers. If you like this sort of content, it's not just projects that we do. We have got over 150 videos showing you how to build, maintain, repair, and convert your own camper van. Now, all the videos and playlists you'll find in links down below, but you can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and we also have a podcast, which is the Camper Van Cast. And again, you can find it in a link down below. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.